Welcome to The Artist Matters. I'm Alex Rudy, and each week you will meet incredible artists from all walks of life. Filmmakers, writers, actors, painters, musicians, and so many more sharing their stories to motivate and inspire the creative in you. Whether you're doing it for fun or looking to make a living, this show will help you on your journey to bring out the artist within and letting the world know that your art matters. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Artist Matters. I'm your host, Alex Rudy. Hope everyone's doing well. And uh, we have a special day. Yes, today, June 24th, is my dad's birthday. So happy birthday, Dad. And it's kind of appropriate that today's guest falls on your birthday because once upon a time, you were working for a jeweler, Dad. I know back in the 70s, he was working for a jeweler in Manhattan, I believe, or might have been the Bronx, but I know he was. I'm not sure exactly what he did, but he did work for a jeweler. And today's guest is a jeweler, the first jeweler we're having on the show. And her name is Hamila Kureshi. Hamila's always been an artistic and creative type. And her parents were okay with this, but maybe as a hobby or something on the side, they did want her to go to school for pharmacy, but her creative side won out. She just didn't like it and didn't want to stick with the pharmaceutical area. So she had to find something else to do and eventually got immersed in more design and woodworking and metalworking. And it's through the metalworking that she started finding herself making jewelry out of these pieces of metal. And someone suggested, you know, maybe you should do jewelry. And from there, she just started making more pieces from earrings to bracelets to necklaces. And then some people were saying, when are you going to start selling this stuff? So after a little hard work and dedication, she opened up her own website, hamila.com, and started selling some of her pieces, which she names after people she knows. That's a very unique twist, but it's extra special because it now has an attachment to someone she knows and their story is woven into the jewelry. I like that. This year, Hamila began working for Limbo Jewelry as a jewelry production assistant. And it's a dream job because she's admired the store for years and now she's working for them. But Hamila also believes in giving back and she has volunteered for the nonprofit organization called Liberty for North Korea, which helps North Korean refugees. You can also view her on a TEDx talk about the subject, which is available online. And I checked it out and it brought my attention to the subject. I never knew this was a nonprofit and I'm glad she was a speaker for this topic. But there's a lot more to her story, so enough of my yakking. Let's get down to it and enjoy my chat with Hamila Kureshi. And we've got Hamila. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you for being here. My first jeweler. <laughs> yes. An art we haven't explored yet on the show. Can't wait. So, let's begin at the beginning. Where were you born? I was born in Tucson, Arizona. Arizona. Yeah. And what are your, some of your early artistic memories? Um, I feel like art has always been in my family, but it was always something that was a hobby and not something that we really considered a career. I remember having a lot of craft books around the house or when I'd be bored, I'd like find things and break them down and put them together in different ways. Um, I'd never considered jewelry a career, but I, looking back now, I remember I would take apart earrings and make new ones out of them and put things on like earring hooks and anything I could make into earrings, I would. 
Um, and then I think when I was in high school, my dad started picking up stained glass and glass fusion, and he taught me all that. So I did that for several years. Um, but yeah, I've always just really loved art and furniture and architecture. And I think the glass was the first time I fully explored a creative medium. Mm. And then after that, I went into, like, after college and everything, I went back to, like, a community college, and I started taking classes in um, art metals and woodworking, and then that led me into jewelry where I am now. So father was into stained glass? Mm -hmm. How did he get into that? There was one summer where my mother and us kids, we were road tripping around the country and he was super bored so he just tried to find things to do and he ended up at a stained glass class and he loved it and now we have kilns and a whole glass studio downstairs so it's really cool and you still dabble occasionally it's been a while but yeah but your family had different plans for you instead of your creativity they wanted you to become a pharmacist Yes, my dad is a pharmacist, and they wanted another one in the family. Um, When I got accepted into pharmacy school, I was actually in a Design 2 class. Um, It was a 3D design class, and I think that was the first, like, artistic class I took, and that was just for kicks and giggles. Um, But when I took that class, I found out I got into pharmacy school then, and my instructor was super disappointed. Mm. So, yeah. Um, But, yeah, I went to pharmacy school for two years. I eventually got kicked out because (laughs) I wasn't meant to be there, and it was very obvious. But it was a tough time, but ultimately I do think it was for the best. Well, that makes me wonder, then, why do you think so many parents have little faith in their children pursuing a career in the arts? Well, I come from an immigrant family, so for them the first thing is just security. Hmm. And so my dad was able to find that financial security through pharmacy, and he just wanted me to have that there. They were okay with me pursuing the arts as long as I had some sort of backup first. So Mm -hmm. they're like, yes, finish pharmacy school, find a job where you're stable, and then do whatever you want. Hmm. But life has other plans. So you were kicked out. Yes. And you said it was the same day? It was Mm -hmm. the same week as my mom was graduating with her master's. So we had a whole bunch of family come in. It was very Mm. awkward. (laughs) Hey, congrats to you, but you young... (laughs) Well, I didn't tell them I was kicked out. I just said that I decided to leave, and everyone was very confused, but they let me have it. So So where does the creative journey take you after that? Um, So (laughs) after that, I... After I got kicked out of pharmacy school, I finished up a degree in nutrition because it was the fastest thing. At that point, I think I'd already been in college for like three years. And to get a design degree, it would be another four years. So I took another year, finished off the nutrition degree, and then I spent a year interning for a nonprofit called Liberty in North Korea. And that was the first place where like the creative director of Liberty in North Korea, he saw some of the things I did at a local level. And he was like, you should be a designer. And he asked why I had an intern with them, because I did a lot of graphic design work for our local team. And so he asked me to intern with them, and I said that there really isn't a position I could fill. So he created one that fit between two other positions um, so I could explore the creative side of things while still working with, like, local teams and whatnot. So that was the first time someone had actually, like, um, trusted me with all these creative endeavors or, like, believed in me. So that gave me a little bit of a push. And then once I came back from California back to Texas, I started signing up for, like, arts classes here and trying to see what I wanted to do. Uh, My parents still wanted me to get a professional degree in something, so I was thinking about industrial design. uh, But all the places I was looking at didn't seem like they were a good fit for me. Mm. So eventually I just went to my local community college, and I was like, this is what I want to do. How can you help me? And they basically said they didn't have anything. So I took all their different programs and I tried to make something that worked for me. And in, like initially it didn't involve jewelry at all. It was, um, I wanted to create furniture. So it was a lot of welding and woodworking. Um, but in one of my art metals classes, my instructor saw that I kept making bracelets. So he was like, we have a really good jewelry department here. I think you'd really like it. Hmm. So I started that about a year and a half ago and I fell in love. It's been great. But what drew you to furniture in the first place? That's something that 
seems a little different from where you were headed. Uh, like when I was little, I used to really love catalogs, like furniture catalogs, oh. Ikea catalogs for some reason. I really, really loved them. Mm-hmm. And I remember being in like middle school art classes and I would put together these basically dioramas of apartments and build all the furniture and make little models. And then I remember in a physics class, we had to build some basic like house and light it uh, or like, you know, put up all the electricity and get the entire house running on an electrical circuit. But I designed all the furniture in there and I made it out of glass and like cutting up fabrics and all this and that. So I've always had this fascination with like functional design and making something that's useful, but also beautiful. Did you ever consider set design? Was that ever something? <laughs> Someone mentioned it to me about yeah. two years ago, so mm. it was a little late at that point. <laughs> mm. You said you were making bracelets mm-hmm. while in class. How does that happen? Well, You're just taking some metal and crafting it? <laughs> basically, that art metals instructor was very lenient. He basically <laughs> showed you how to use a torch and where the metals were, and he just let you do whatever you wanted. Uh, so I ended up making up tables and like waste paper baskets. But then I would take like rods of bronze and I would make them into these beautiful spiral bracelets. And then I just went from there. I made a bunch of steel bracelets too. And he was like, you would really be good in jewelry. So, so this is 2018. You found jewelry. I did art medals at the end of 2017. And then I started jewelry, the beginning of 2018. Yes. So what is it about jewelry that speaks to you? I think it's it goes back to that functional design. Like it's mm-hmm. something, it's a lot smaller than furniture, so I can create it faster. Mm-hmm. And I'm definitely a person who, instead of sketching, I like to play with the materials. And so jewelry is forgiving in that because it's so small. Um, you don't need a lot of metal. And if you mess up, it's not a big deal. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you're trying to make a bench and you cut the wood wrong, you're screwed. So, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't a huge fan of woodworking, but I do hope to go back one day. And what made you decide to start selling jewelry? I just had friends who just kept asking. <laughs> <laughs> they saw what I made and they kept asking. And yeah, it just went from there. Well, Eventually I was like, yes, I'll put together some sort of a website. We'll have a launch date. And people actually bought it. So so what was this? the website? Is it still the, the one you have right now? It is. It is. It's just hamila.com. Um, it's a little prettier now, but it's still a work in progress. It's in the middle of a redesign right now. Um, but yeah, it's a small collection, but it seems to be doing fairly well. What do you sell? What kind of jewelry? I love earrings the most. So yeah. that's mostly what it is, but we do have a few rings and in about two weeks or so, there should be necklaces and bracelets up there too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What did you do to gain more exposure for your business? And that's a part that I'm still struggling Mm. with. I think for me, the biggest thing is just kind of, it sounds a little lame, but just being true to myself. Like I want to, I don't want to just make sales for the sake of making sales. I want people to know like all the work that goes behind it. I, one thing I really love and is really important to me is community. And I've looking back, I've realized I've always tried to cultivate community in my life. And so even with this jewelry line, like I name every piece after someone I know and I weave their story into it. Hmm. So for me, it's like creating that story behind each piece, sharing that with everyone. Like that's helped bring in people. But like marketing is still something I'm struggling with. But I think just by being true to that and trying to show people the story behind everything, I think that's the best thing I can do for it. Was that a decision from the beginning that you wanted to name your jewelry after people you know? Yeah, yeah. That's very unique. I have difficulty naming things, and so I was talking to a friend about it, and she said, well, you always try to include the people around you. So she's like, why don't you do that here as well? And what was the first piece you made with a person's name? It It was these earrings I made my mom for Mother's Day, so it worked out perfectly. (laughs) Yeah. That made uh, leaving pharmacy school less painful. (laughs) You got jewelry named after your mom. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't let her see the description before I launched. And I think the day I actually launched, I was out of town. 